Over 7 billion pounds of commercial explosive materials are used each year in mining, construction, oil and gas recovery, and other industrial uses. The U.S. Department of Transportation and the commercial explosives industry, through the Institute of Makers of Explosives, have established rigorous and comprehensive safety standards. The industry has maintained an outstanding safety record, but incidents are still possible. In a recent five-year period, there were 105 highway incidents involving commercial explosives. Under the U.S. Department of Transportation's Hazard Classification System, explosives are Class I, made up of six divisions. Division 1.1 are explosives with a mass explosion hazard, such as TNT. Division 1.2 are explosives with a projection hazard, such as munitions. 1.3 are explosives with predominantly a fire hazard, such as fireworks. 1.4 are explosives with no significant blast hazard, such as detonators. 1.5 are very insensitive explosives with a mass explosion hazard, such as blasting agents. And Division 1.6 are extremely insensitive articles. This program is called Responding to Highway Incidents Involving Commercial Explosives. It is designed to teach firefighters, law enforcement, emergency medical services, emergency management, truck drivers, and industry personnel how to respond safely to incidents involving commercial explosives. This program will show basic response procedures, including controlling the scene, identifying the presence of explosives, and evaluating hazards and risks. Dealing with fires will be discussed, as well as handling incidents in which there is no fire. There should be a standard approach to handling every incident. Using the incident command system, the ranking person of the first unit on the scene should establish command. Later, as more resources arrive, command may be passed to a more senior or more qualified individual. A perimeter must be established to control access to the incident scene and to direct traffic away. Unauthorized persons should be removed from the immediate area and kept outside the perimeter. Control zone should be established. The hot zone should be in accordance with the recommended evacuation distances. If there is no fire, DOT's Emergency Response Guidebook, or ERG, recommends an initial evacuation of at least one half mile in all directions for large spills of all Class I materials except for Divisions 1.4 and 1.6, for which the recommended minimum distance is 800 feet. Sources of ignition, including mechanical equipment, must be controlled. Command should carry out a thorough 360-degree size-up. What kind of vehicle is involved? Several different types of vehicles are used to move explosives over highways. Large tractor trailers may be used as well as smaller trucks, some trucks may be equipped with portable magazines. Bulk trucks, which can deliver, mix, and load explosive materials directly at the blast location, may be encountered. The wide variety of hazmat carried on some bulk trucks can complicate the size up. If compartments of these trucks are ruptured in an accident and the products become inadvertently mixed, it is unlikely that the mixture will become sensitized. What is the material involved? DOT placards or labels may be evident. Responders may use the ERG to learn more about the product and basic response procedures. Trucks carrying Division 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 non-bulk packaged explosives or any quantity of bulk explosives should be placarded on all four sides. Trucks carrying over 1,000 pounds of Division 1.4, 1.5 and 1.6 non-bulk packaged explosives should also be placarded. Compatibility groups provide further information about the hazards of the Class I materials. Although optional, explosives placards may display a compatibility group. 
Class 1 non-bulk package labels should always show the compatibility group. On shipping papers, the compatibility group letter should be immediately on the right of the division number. The glossary in the back of the Emergency Response Guidebook provides helpful details on compatibility groups. More permissive response procedures are permitted for Compatibility Group 1.4S. A placarded truck can contain a wide assortment of explosives of varying sizes and packaging. Division 1.1D substances such as PETN, TNT, RDX, and HMX are packaged in fiberboard boxes or drums, weighing up to 60 pounds. Blasting explosives, Division 1.1D, are granular, gelled, or emulsified substances normally packaged in 40 to 60 pound fiberboard boxes. There may be from 2 to 100 individual cartridges in the box. The cartridge wrappers are usually paper, spiral-bound fiberboard tapered nose tubes, cylindrical fiberboard tubes, or plastic film. Cartridges are usually from 1 to 4 inches in diameter and 8 to 16 inches in length. Division 1.1D boosters are cast mixtures of explosive substances and may be wrapped in fiberboard or plastic. Individual boosters can vary from a few grams to 5 pounds. Boosters are shipped in fiberboard boxes weighing up to 60 pounds. There could be as many as 500 boosters in a box. Detonators may be classified as Division 1.1B, 1.4B, or 1.4S. They are manufactured in a multitude of sizes, shapes, and colors. Attached leg wires may be from 4 to 200 feet long. Non-electric detonators, or detonator assemblies, may be attached to plastic tubing ranging from 3 to 1,000 feet and may be coiled or spooled. Detonators are shipped in fiberboard cases or boxes of varying sizes and weights. Usually there is an inner packaging of fiberboard boxes or foil pouches. Detonating cord, Division 1.1D or 1.4D, is a rope-like product with a high explosive core, which may be found in varying colors. Fiberboard boxes usually contain two 1,000-foot spools, but detonating cord may be encountered in other length spools and packaging as well. Responders may encounter specialty explosive products, which may be in any of the Class 1 divisions. These include such products as shaped charges, cutters, and perforating guns. Packaged Division 1.5D explosives, or blasting agents, are shipped in 50-pound paper bags with plastic liners, or woven bags with plastic liners, which can weigh from 10 to 70 pounds. Bulk blasting agents may be shipped in large cargo tank trucks or in straight trucks with one or more separate cargo tanks. The components of blasting agents may be shipped in compartmentalized mixing trucks. At the worksite, the components are blended to form the blasting agent. These trucks can carry a wide variety of hazardous materials and may show a combination of placards. Explosive, Division 1.1, 1.4, or 1.5. Combustible, Class 3, Corrosive, Class 8, and Oxidizer, Division 5.1. These bulk trucks may also display orange panels with four-digit UN identification numbers. Ammonium nitrate, a Division 5.1 oxidizer, may be in the form of a small white prill, an emulsion, or a solution. Ammonium nitrate is capable of detonation or explosive decomposition, but requires an initiating source, or it must be heated under confinement before initiation, as has occurred in a number of infamous industrial accidents. Fertilizer-grade ammonium nitrate must not be confused with ammonium nitrate mixed with fuel oil, called ANFO, a Division 1.5 blasting agent used in commercial blasting work. ANFO is often pink in color and has the distinctive odor of fuel oil. 
Fire may break out on the body, on the tires, in the cab or engine, or in the cargo of a truck. At the first sign of a fire, the driver is instructed to guide the truck to a safe area. We've got smoke, we've got a fire. Go underway, drop the cone, flag traffic. If not injured, the driver is instructed to take charge of the scene until emergency responders arrive. An explosives carrying vehicle may have two drivers, and both should be accounted for. Shipping papers may answer a number of questions if they can be obtained without undue risk to response personnel. Under normal conditions, the shipping papers should be in a pocket on the driver's door or within reach of the driver. If the driver leaves the vehicle, the shipping papers should be left on the driver's seat. In an emergency, if able, drivers should take the shipping papers and provide them to emergency responders. The shipping papers should show the quantity of explosives, the proper shipping name, the hazard class and division, the compatibility group, the net explosive weight, and UN number. The shipping papers should also provide a 24-hour emergency response phone number for the company whose materials are being transported. If that number is not available or does not answer, a number listed in front and back of the ERG should be called. The shipping papers may also provide contact information for the receiver. There are more questions that should be answered during the size-up. What is the nature and extent of injuries resulting from the incident? What is the condition of packages? What are conditions in the area? What is the topography and land use, particularly as it relates to transportation systems? What is the access to the scene? Are there nearby bodies of water, storm drains or sewers? What is the weather and in what direction is the wind blowing? Are there overhead or underground wires and pipelines in the area? Are there possible ignition sources? Situation. We're going to need FD and hazmat personnel. Yeah. Uh, according to the placards, there are explosives, uh -huh. so we've got to consider the safety the risk to our guys. Okay. As information is gathered, command must evaluate the hazards and risks. What hazards are posed by the materials involved in the incident? What are the risks posed by committing responders into the hot zone? An accountability system must be in place for all response personnel, and particularly for those responders entering and leaving the hot zone. The primary objective of the response is to save lives. Secondary objectives are to prevent damage to property and the environment. Strategy may be in the offensive mode, aggressive action taken to quickly control the problem. Defensive strategy is less aggressive and directed toward limiting the overall size and impact of the problem. Our units, uh, we're going to go ahead and back out of here one half mile. Non-intervention is a strategy that may be selected when the incident commander determines that both offensive and defensive operations will place emergency responders at unacceptable levels of risk, such as the possibility of an explosion. With the non-intervention strategy, no action is taken except to isolate and evacuate the area. Please don't shoot the Hey, we have a hazardous situation. Y'all gonna have to turn around and go back the way you came. Prior to committing responders to tactical operations in the hot zone, as much information as possible should be gathered. Response guides will offer advice. Industry personnel may be on the scene or available by phone. Command must coordinate the multiple response agencies that may arrive on scene. 
In addition to fire and police, local EMS and emergency management personnel may respond, as well as state police, bomb squads, and such federal agencies as the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Private sector personnel may arrive, representing the manufacturer, the carrier, and the shipper. There may be cleanup contractors and tow truck operators. No protective clothing ensemble will provide responders with protection against the effects of an explosion. However, if responders are to be committed to the hot zone of an explosives incident, they should wear the full protective ensemble designed for structural firefighting. In any firefighting operation, SCBA is required. If an explosion has occurred before responders arrive, they must be aware of the possibility of additional explosions. Any fires resulting from the explosion should be extinguished. Then, a search should be carried out for survivors, who, if found, should be removed from the scene and treated. A secondary search should be conducted to recover any live explosives projected from the incident scene. The driver or operator of the vehicle is an important source of information. The driver should know the class and division of the explosives in the vehicle, the inherent dangers, and procedures to be followed to protect the public from those dangers. Responders to the scene of a cargo fire in an explosives truck should assume that the materials will detonate, even though some explosive materials can be completely consumed by fire without detonating. No effort should be made to fight a fire in a cargo of explosives. Instead, if Division 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, or 1.5 materials are involved in the fire, Evacuate the area for a one-mile radius and let the fire burn. If the product is an oxidizer, a similar tactic should be employed. Evacuate the area for a one-mile radius and let the fire burn. If only Division 1.4 or Division 1.6 materials are involved in the fire, evacuate the area for one-third of a mile. If only Division 1.4 Compatibility Group S explosives are involved, consider isolating at least 50 feet in all directions. Only 1.4 S explosive fires may be fought with normal precautions from a reasonable distance. When burning, explosives and oxidizers give off toxic smoke. If the fire is on the body of the truck, unmanned monitors should be used for extinguishment. Evacuate at once if it appears the fire will reach the cargo. There should be a procedure in place, such as an audible warning, to evacuate personnel from the hot zone without delay. A tire fire can be extinguished with a dry chemical fire extinguisher or water. Firefighters should stand by in case the fire rekindles. As soon as it is safe to do so, the tire should be removed from the truck. When the fire is in the cab or engine of the truck, water or dry chemical can be used to fight the fire. When possible, separate the cab from the body, then disconnect the battery. If there is no fire, responders must control all sources of ignition. The engine of the truck and any emergency response vehicles in the immediate area should be shut off. Hose lines and fire extinguishers should be deployed in case fire breaks out. A search should be conducted for leaking fuel lines or tanks. If a leak is found, it should be covered with Class B alcohol-resistant foam. A direct blow, spark, heat, friction, or static electricity can set off some explosives. 
Spark-resistant tools should be used when working on wreckage near spilled materials or fuel. Grounding will help reduce problems from static electricity. Thorough wetting of the area will reduce the danger of explosion. Wash water may have to be controlled. Nearby storm drains, bodies of water, and sewers should be protected and water authorities notified. To prevent unbroken packages from becoming involved in a potential fire, they may be isolated until they can be loaded into an appropriate explosives carrying vehicle. Command should determine if explosives have contaminated personnel or equipment. Procedures for decontamination will have to be organized. If explosive material has contacted any part of the body or protective clothing, the product can be washed away with copious amounts of water. Before the incident can be terminated, the scene will have to be cleaned up. This is usually carried out by a private contractor selected by the shipper. However, the responding authority may provide oversight. A debriefing for emergency response personnel should be carried out before any responders leave the scene. The debriefing should address safety issues such as signs and symptoms of exposure, delayed health effects, decontamination or disposal of equipment, and care of protective clothing. Later, a critique can be held to discuss the response and develop recommendations for improving the emergency response system. I don't think we have any, any fear of any, any destabilization of this thing now. The commercial explosives industry has established an exemplary safety record in the transport of explosives. Although infrequent, incidents can happen. Responders should isolate the area determine what products are involved, seek help, evaluate the hazards and risks, and control sources of ignition. Most importantly, responders should not fight a fire in the cargo of the truck. Instead, they should evacuate to a safe distance and let the fire burn itself out. A highway incident involving commercial explosives presents significant risks. Yet, an informed response can handle the incident safely and help keep the community safe.